textbook because this is actually, this textbook in particular uh, just actually uh, deals with the subject pretty well. And it also has the, gives me the ability for us to reference without the internet. Thank goodness. <laughs> That's why I brought it. It also gives us uh, the opportunity to reference other things. If somebody has a question that I might not know the answer to right off the top of my head, but if I can read a couple sentences, it'll jog my memory. So, um, so we do want to get to... Now, as you see, this is a this is a full economics textbook, and you see, it, you have to have a, a quite a chunk of understanding before you even get to this part of the book. So, um, please question aggressively, or I don't know if you want to use the word aggressively, or but but assertively, <laughs> assertive about asking questions. If you have even the slightest lack of understanding of anything that I'm saying. This is economics, right? Yes. So, does everyone, uh, does anybody understand what money is? Because this is a, no. an important foundational <laughs> piece of knowledge to. before we can even get into anything I'm, else. I'm what is money? It. Well, money serves four purposes. Now, the first one is a medium of exchange. Can anybody describe to me what a medium of exchange is? Something, Something <laughs> to use to facilitate exchange so you don't have to have direct barter. Yes, exactly. That's that's a, that's an almost perfect. It, it's essentially something that you can trade for things of value and freely, and that everyone accepts has that value. It's a labor of unit, a, a unit of labor exchange for something you need. It can be a unit of labor, but it but it need it it, it it would not it does not necessarily need to be a unit of labor, but ultimately. I mean, there are there are theorists that say that it ultimately derives from that, but <clears throat> but for example, if you use a medium of exchange of gold, and then all of a sudden you just happen to find a mountain of gold, well, all of a sudden you have a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with uh, the human labor necessarily. So um, now, second function of money is a unit of accounting. Now that is so we can keep track of the value of things. That's a pretty pretty self-explanatory. It just in its, in its very name. Uh, also, a store of value. Um, something like a cantaloupe is not a very good store of value. Because, first of all, you have to find somebody who wants the cantaloupe, and you have to find that person before the cantaloupe is is gone from, from a useful service, <laughs> so to speak. So, now there's a... There's a uh, so it allows you to store value... Medium of exchange. So no, no, the first example under unit of accounting. Was... Uh, so it, it's basically just, it's basically a measure of... It's, it's a measure, it's a measuring uh, tool, like a yardstick. It would, it would be, it'd be a measuring tool, like, you know, we're going to say, well, um, you know, you could measure money in pounds if you, if you really wanted to. I mean, and, and when it was precious metals, you did measure it in, in weight at, at, a, at a certain uh, So, now it's also a standard of deferred payment. Now, this one's a little more complicated because it's actually, you're using it as a medium of exchange and as a unit of accounting at the same time. It's a unit of accounting how much you owe, and when you pay what you owe, it's used as a medium of exchange. But because it allows deferred payment, that's what allows debt. So that is a it 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 deserves its own category. That particular combination of those two things. Uh, now, does anybody does everybody know what liquidity is? No, liquidity is. Uh, so how, you know? how easily you can have something be basically exchangeable as cash, essentially. Exchange it, it's, it's, it, as opposed to something that is yes you can't readily like change it in cash yeah. le levels house of liquidity really it, yeah. when somebody speaks of liquidity it's it's how easily that can be converted exactly. into some into basically a medium of exchange that everyone will accept yeah essentially <laughs> so have we uh, yeah got had any luck with oh, interrupts yet I realized yet? that I do not have enough <laughs> This but is going to be my history part. Was 
I do have buy, but for this purposes purpose, we're gonna we're gonna only deal with what's called M1, which is essentially currency, coins, travelers' checks, and checkable deposits. Deposits that you can basically just write a check and it comes out. And checkable deposits. It was, excuse me, currency coins, checkable deposits, and travelers' checks. Now, travelers' checks is like oh, well, a little over half of, of a percent of that. It's about half currency and coins and half checkable deposits. So, meaning, meaning that the other half of M1, which is the what we would consider to be money, most which is what most people would be considered to be money, um, is about half currency coin and half checkable deposits. So half, half of it's basically just existing in someone in a computer in our heads. Yeah. Well, well all, yeah. Mon all money, yeah, is, yeah. all money essentially. Um, I have a. This is a an interesting little Zen question: Is what, what is a dollar worth? Does anybody want to answer that? What everybody agrees with? That's a good answer. Um, what I, what the, the the standard answer is is whatever you can get someone else to give you for it. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be agreed upon by everyone. If you can get one person to agree that it's worth, <laughs> this is going to be amazing. Uh, okay. And I could buy an orange. Oh, wow, this is a little thing. Um, so. So that, um, when we get into uh, what the Federal Reserve does and how it does those things, and would you like to get into the history of that first? Or would you like to get... Because we now that we understand basically what money is, we can get... Um, what I was thinking of doing is is going to the... Uh, it says, could not connect to the server. Oh, Christ. <laughs> You're just not meant to get on the net. I guess I'm not. I don't know why that's doing that. I'm so we got sorry. M1, M2, M3. Here we go. <laughs> we're like... We're totally... <laughs> we're like multi... You can juggle iPads here. <laughs> Wait, select a wireless network. Um, well, money's imaginary, but it's yeah, worth whatever we can get for it. And it's uh, it's basically yeah, and my, something my 3G that you can use not working very well in place of bartering things. Um, a medium of exchange, um, a method to measure how much things are worth and for accounting, basically. So it's just like a unit of measurement. Yay! And, uh, and then he just mentioned that like half half of the okay. money at this point any exists questions? in currency and half is just like in in bank account, like digit, you know. Computers. Okay, <laughs> since there's no the curiosity, I will go ahead and tell you what M2 is. Now, M2 is, and I, you're right, I should have, I should do M2. M2 is M1, M1 is 21, 22%, depending on the year of, of M2. It's included in M2. It's a component. Um, also, it is savings deposits at all depository institutions. So, in other words, checkable deposits and saving deposits are considered to be different things. Hmm. It's basically liquidity. It's it's savings. You can't just go and run your card or write a check and dump that savings. You have to go into the institution and withdraw the savings, or you have to transfer it. So that's the difference between checkable deposits, savings deposits. Yes. <clears throat> yes. And then small time deposits at all depository in institutions. Um, these are also just little deposits that are in it. It's, it's similar to the savings as well. Um, and then uh, money market mutual fund shares, which is similar to uh, to that type of deposit. You can convert mutual funds pretty easily. It's it's not like a regular, regular stock. Uh, mutual funds are a little easier to uh, transfer around because they're... Uh, First white. Yes. With a uh, checkable deposit, is that is that money that's not available to uh, 
to use in the fractional reserve banking to loan out additional oh no it's deposits? it's all available <laughs> generally yeah <laughs> um yeah and we'll get it we'll get into the we can go over fractional reserve also which is another subtopic there's a lot of subtopics that's the thing is because this is a very very complex very highly integrated system now um I do want to just at least briefly, before we move on with this, go over the uh, go over the history of the Federal Reserve because that's actually very, very interesting. Um, now, we go over this thing, and I love this. I want to get one of these. Okay, so. Does anybody know when the first attempted national national currency when that when that occurred at national currency here in this country in the U.S. Five. In fact, prior to the Declaration of Independent Independence, we attempted to do that. If you read, and I. I could look up the quote, but there, there's a lot of anti-Big Bank quotes from the founders. Realize that a lot of these folks were fairly wealthy in their colonial environment, and they were really having the screws put to them via centralized banking. They, they were being forced into unfavorable positions by that banking by system. Asia? By Well, East India Company was, well, and Britain as well, that... Uh, the history of private companies using government threat of force to force favorable deals is, is, is long and storied, and that, that would be, you know, the, the tea, like tea protesting. They're putting these, they're taxing tea, and they're also getting gouged on tea by having to get it from East India Company, who is all too happy to collect those taxes as well, because they're part of the enforcement scheme of the whole thing. It, it gets pretty interesting, but I um, don't want to get too far off topic. Mm -hmm. um, now, in 1791, that's when the first Bank of the United States was made. Um, President Madison, uh, the Congress under President Madison, refused to renew its charter 20 years later. He said, oh, okay, not working too much. And you will see that, and I don't even really need to get into the specifics of all the allegations and that sort of thing. They're very similar to the ones that all the complaints are very pretty much the same is that a bunch of very very wealthy bankers are controlling too much stuff and they're swinging things the way that they want things to swing and this is supposed to be a democratic republic and that's not working for us um, and then um, now five years later though Madison did come and they said okay well, we're going to try the second bank of the United States uh, 20 years later Jackson gets rid of it. So, and and he was very forceful in his stance. That, I mean, that, that there's just out and out corruption going on with, with it, um, especially in regards to moving the levers of government to uh, to give certain groups, people, very favorable status. I mean, it, uh, <clears throat> now the Federal Reserve Act. That's the interesting one. I'm going to read a quote. This is from. Um, this is actually from the. Uh, let me get this quote out here. Where were we? Give me just a moment to uh, reference this particular thing. Essentially, it was a group of very powerful men that got together on Jekyll Island and figured out how the Federal Reserve was going to work. This was not a uh, a transparent process by any by any means, and in fact, that's why I want to get the uh, this quote for you. One of them essentially saying that if the American people had any inkling of the people who are getting together to decide this, that it would have, there would have been like mass chaos from people would not have been happy. It says here, we, here is uh, Vander, uh, excuse me. Frank Vanderlip, he was president of the National City Bank of New York, and he is uh, a representative of the Rockefeller family. So, to give you an idea, all those big names that you hear about in the conspiracy theories, 
yes, those guys were all pretty much at this meeting on this secret island that no one was supposed to know about, meeting with people in the government to decide upon how we we're going to create this central bank. And that was so, yeah, what year are you talking about? Um, this was 1910 or? when they started getting together. Here, I'll, I'll just read this. In 1910, Aldrich and executives representing the banks of J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Kuhn, Loeb, and Company... Uh, and Kuhn, Love and Company secluded themselves for 10 days at Jekyll Island, Georgia. Um, they had, in addition to Frank Vanderlip, there, uh, there was the uh, Henry Davison, who's senior partner at J.P. Morgan, uh, Charles D. Norton, president of First National Bank of New York. You notice there's a lot in New York, and you'll also notice in the structure of it that New, the, the New York Fed is the only one that always gets to vote. All the rest of them rotate. But that, they're like the permanent seat because that's where everything's controlled from, essentially. Um, so, and then, uh, also uh, Colonel Edward House, who would later become President Woodrow Wilson, who passed this act's uh, <laughs> closest advisor, and he was the founder of the Council on Foreign Relations. So, Big guys. Now, here's what Vanderlip wrote in his 1935 autobiography, From Farm Boy to Financier. You can tell he's very proud of himself. Uh, I was as secretive, indeed, I was as furtive as any conspirator. Delivery, we knew, simply must not happen, or else all our time and effort would have been wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. So essentially, he's saying that a bunch of these rich guys got together and that if they were found out to have been... I mean, he even uses the word conspire. <laughs> conspiring to build this thing the way they wanted to... Uh, would not have happened. In the same way that you hear uh, folks now who want a full transparent audit of the Fed, that uh, if the American people could see exactly what goes on with all those functions, that they would be incredibly offended and would find it unacceptable. Um, just as we, the, the 7.7 7, uh, trillion, trillion dollar uh, worth of loans that were, or worth of discount window, quick loans that were given out. Yeah. That, uh, that's a different, and, and, and there's a particularly offensive, I'll just mention this as, as an aside, they're lending, they're, they were lending, they were, this money out at 0.01% interest, but then these banks were using it to buy treasuries at 3%. <laughs> so basically, the government was giving them money and letting them profit off taxpayers while they were doing it. Yeah. So, in in the name of of securing the financial system, of course, and, and making sure everything's all good for us. <laughs> but if you read anything about the history of banking, you will see that this is not the hundredth time this has happened that that in the entire the history of banking everywhere where there's where there's this this kind of banking you have this exact type of thing you, you have a lack this kind of banking? meaning any kind of meaning meaning a financial system where that allows debt and, and lending anytime you allow lending and any anytime you have anything um, that has that kind of lack of transparency where it's like okay well you know, I write this check, you accept this check, they say everything's good, and everybody has that perception of everything being okay. Well, think about it. If I if I put an extra ten thousand if I printed up ten thousand dollars, put it in my pocket, you wouldn't notice it in this economy, would you? If I printed up a billion dollars, you wouldn't notice it. It it's noticed as it sifts through eventually, that's what causes inflation essentially, is you start getting too much money for the amount of stuff that's out there that's a, that has other value. Make, makes the prices go up. But, uh, okay, so we uh, they actually fought for a private monopoly with little to no government interference. They wanted literally the original Federal Reserve plan. I mean, these guys these guys came up with some. I mean, you, 
gotta admit that the one percent consistently just has just brass ones. Like they, they will go for they will go for full on tyranny right off the bat. I mean, you'll see, and that's what's crazy about now is they've realized they can run with it a certain amount, and that nobody will really do much about it. It isn't until now that now we're getting these Occupy protests and the Arab Spring and the Indignados in uh, in uh, Spain that it's causing so much of a so much of a systemic shock in all these countries that people are losing it over it. So, um, anyway, uh, essentially, um, oh, uh, William Jennings Bryan also said, big financiers are, are the back of the uh, Aldrich currency scheme, that big bankers would then be in complete control of everything through control of our national finances. And, uh, also, fun fact, given that 29% of all U.S. profits were finance profits, that is indeed, if you think about it, what do you, uh, meaning finance industry, financing activities had accounted for 29% of all U.S. profits uh, last year. Well, not, not 2011, excuse me, 2000, this is 2010, but I'm sure it's a similar or yeah. higher number now. Well, financing activities, in, basically, all these derivative schemes and all the rest, all this money that these people are making off, off trading paper, that is accounting for 29% of... Our gross domestic product or something like that? Of all profits. It's not GDP, because that's a different measure. That's okay. all economic activity. But if you think about that, what are they creating that is of actual value? Well, they're creating some things of value. I mean, uh, when... A merchant needs to borrow money every month to meet his payroll, and a lot of businesses, well, a lot of businesses, they run on, like, net 30, like retail businesses. They don't have to pay until 30 days after, but they get a discount if they pay earlier, and they use these very short-term, less than 30-day loans every month to make their payroll, because they have to pay every two weeks, so they have that intermediate, and they want to make their money at the end of the month. And it's a very thin, you know, retail can be a very thin margin, so they need that activity to do that. That, that is a useful function of finance, for example. And, and there's a lot of them. I mean, okay. you, need, you uh, make car payments, house payments. Loans. I mean, loans and that sort of thing. All those activities. Loans and investments. Yes. Except that if you see now, it's such an outsized portion of our economy, and it's because, and this is an opinion, but it's backed by quite a bit of fact, that it's essentially a big paper trading Ponzi scheme where they're 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 rewrapping this debt and then taking a bet against this, and there's a lot of there's a lot of rules that used to be in place that have been gradually eroded, and that could be a whole teach-in of like the gradual erosion that's led us to the point where they're so deregulated now that we're having other systemic problems like commodity prices are being are being ratcheted up and down into these volatile cycles so these guys can make money because flash money only can be made if there's a lot of volatility. Everybody knows what volatility is. It's like an increase and decrease in, in price or value. So if you have if you're cracking a whip and you can and you can catch it on the top and make a bet that it's gonna crash and when it does and you also have the influence and well you also have the influence here it's like me taking a life insurance policy out on her and then hiring somebody to push her off a cliff. Because yeah. that's essentially yeah. what they do. Yeah. Or and then, like, taking a life insurance policy on that guy, and while he's pushing her off a cliff, pushing him off the cliff. I mean, that, that's essentially yeah. what they do. Yeah. And then, if, and then you know, you got, eventually, all this stuff starts falling apart because it's, it's all connected, and people can't pay what they say these things are worth because they're really not actually worth that at all. So, so for example, if you, like, for example, if I decided, oh, I have... $2,000, I want to give it to a financial advisor to have him invested in stocks. Mm -hmm. But there's like scotch rates, so you can kind of do it on your own now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's any good, whatever. That doesn't tie into this at this point. But, so I say I do that, and he knows that in a week, this the, the companies he's telling me are really good, and he's investing in, and he's researching stuff like that. He knows that in, I don't know, a few years they're going to crash based on they're not sustainable he has some inside information then he'll like he could just lead me astray in that way even though i'm paying him to do me a service in, to in fact that's money. what goldman sachs yeah. has already i mean in front of congress yeah. admitted to doing and i i don't understand 
to be honest with you, and, and I, I mean, I have a law degree. I don't understand by what legal machinations they're coming up with that that is not malfeasance. Yeah. Like, you're supposed to have a fiduciary duty when you do that. And if you're creating things that are designed to fail, and in fact creating another division that's designed yep. to profit when it does yep. by taking short bets on it, yep. no, I mean there's and there's significant evidence at this point. I think where you can really make a strong argument for that it's just it's a comp- all of the big financial firms are deeply involved in fraudulent activity. What bills are going through Congress? They know, like, mm-hmm. oh, unfortunately, they kind of control the, si- the system that, by which they so they're, they're like, judged. Okay, well, mm-hmm. I'll just leave this person and uh, that's done now. through a fairly. <laughs> Too bad for them. Sorry. I better get back on yeah, I, on track, though. Nice um, okay, so okay, so let's see. I actually found that's like a, a picture. It says I paid one hundred twenty-five thousand eight. 869 into a house currently worth 91000 but the bank is taking it back because I still owe them 355692 <laughs> I would be happy so to also address that, that specific because t- that because the real the artificial real estate whipping yeah. up and down is another it's a classic exactly what predatory financial People and or institutions have been doing for thousands of years. It's it's a very you bubble up an asset and you make money while you're doing that because you know about when it's gonna happen and then and then when it drops you still ask for the same amount of money and of course you're not expecting to get it all back but you end up with all the assets back. Right. So you end up with whatever payments they had made and all the assets. And that's essentially what they do. And now it's even worse because they can take insurance policies out and it's actually more profitable for them to foreclose than for, because they've created instruments to make it more profitable for them to foreclose and they've been deemed legal. And, and, and all the money that banks lended out to buy all those homes was all fictional anyway. They just created the money on the Well, essentially, yes. Right. Well, essentially, but see, essentially all money is fictional. All money is based on belief. It's so like uh, made, so, so they believe that there's loan, dollars. It's not really a loss to the bank because they invented the, the money in the first place. It is because you got to keep track of that sort of thing. So it could it could make one bank become insolvent, and in fact, it was used. In a, I mean, it it was used in a lot of ways to create that. Oh, let me get the uh, let me get another quote for you on the. This is during the Pujo hearings. Uh, and, this is Democratic lawyer Samuel Untermeyer. He said, If by money trust is meant an established and well-defined identity and community of interest between a few leaders of finance, which has resulted in a vast growing concentration of control of money and credit in the hands of comparatively few men, the condition thus described exists in this country today. To us, the perils manifest when we find the same man a director in a half a dozen or more banks and trust companies all located in the same section of the same city doing the same class of business and with a like set of associates similarly situated all belonging to the same group and representing the same class of interests all further pretense of competition is useless <laughs> so essentially he says that banks all collude to, and and it's very obvious that they do and then they eat each other which is where we're at now we're at we're at comparatively few uh, they, there was a recently a Cornell University study that showed that 40% of all the assets in the world are under the control of 147 very, very closely related financial firms. And a lot of those names are very familiar to you. And a lot of them aren't because they're 147 individual companies. The thing is, um, they did a, it, it wasn't until we've had computers that are as good as we have now that we could you could actually study those control relationships to that degree of certainty in real time and to know because because what it'll be is like a company owns a little piece of this which owns a little and they end up exercising indirect control of a lot of things and they can indirectly really actually it's as good as direct control because they indirectly control from so many different angles and they are all representing more or less the same interests and they're aware those <laughs> companies are aware of each other Oh, absolutely. The the, they're, they're actually closely interrelated, and a lot of them have the same, as he was saying, 
the same guy on several boards. And once you get into, you know, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon with these guys, they're all very, very closely, like they all do business with each other. They're all part of the same club that we are not in. The ones that don't know. They know, and they're just counting. Oh, absolutely. They just count on us not knowing. Yeah, yes. pretty much. <laughs> Um, no, they're, no, they're not even here. They're not in a board. What's that? <laughs> we can go over fractional reserve really quick. That would be. Uh, I think that's just. I'll tell you all the teachings you want to hold. Okay, let's go over frac. Well, before we go on to the right, and I think that's enough yeah, for history for now. Um, one of the things I would like to do is there is some there's some really awesome. Uh, actually, I might keep that just in case I need it. Um, the. Uh, there's some really awesome uh, videos on various topics on the uh, on Khan Academy, and I was almost thinking if we could get like a little online club, like a book club kind of thing, where we could we just need to have a forum for it, and we say, okay, this week let's watch this video, and then when everybody's watched their video, maybe we could have some way that they could check in and say, okay, now that we've all watched it, and then everybody can start making comments and like saying, well, what about this, and and we can talk That's about right, the yeah. discuss each topic. Because you could, you just with little ten-minute videos on there, you could become pretty knowledgeable about banking. Yeah. And that's a very powerful bit of knowledge because most people don't know anything about how that works. K a k h a n like, because uh, his name is I think his name is Salman Khan. It's not uh, Khan from Star Trek. <laughs> Although I always think of that when I see it. I'm like, yeah, Khan. Anyway. Actually, now that you mention. Um, videos and book clubs, I was thinking, like, at least for those of us who are okay with reading, we could have an actual book club, because I still have a list of, I think, like, 20 to 30 books about the whole, like, Occupy thing. Well, we could also do, we could do books, and we could do articles also, like, I mean, we could have, there's a num. I mean, I, there's a lot of really good articles that are out that well, or I'm white, just, you know. I'm just saying if you the, want to get really geeky, we can the, go do some white the, papers. Like, geeky. Like, well, white file. papers yeah, are like, you know, like I read a lot of white papers, uh, like by David Autor, who's a MIT economics professor. They're pretty complicated, um, but at, if you can, you can wrap your head around the abstract and at least kind of pick through it. It's not too bad, and it's interesting because they. It gets into how he finds the data, and you really don't need to worry about that as much unless you're really into that sort of thing. But if you look at their conclusions, you at least have an idea of where they're going with this data. And it's interesting because you start finding things like uh, how technology is affecting jobs, right? Because there's a natural rate of unemployment. I don't. Every every economy has a natural rate of unemployment, and you really can't budge that too much. You, you can temporarily move it, but it will always end up going back. It's it's a all of economics essentially is all about reaching equilibrium. And that's where um, you can identify specific errors in reaching that equilibrium and try to fix them. And sometimes you don't want to fix them. Sometimes it's good to leave it out of equilibrium. Like for example, minimum wage causes more unemployment. It is a fact that it does. If you raise the minimum wage, some jobs will be shed. But then you, you need to honestly look at that and you go, okay, is some lost jobs better because that's going to give more widespread economic power to more people, which will then encourage more local businesses will have more money being spent at them, which could actually end up counteracting that job loss from the minimum wage loss. And you have to make that, what you have to do is you have to make that calculus. And, and that's why you, when you realize that 99% of what politicians say about economics is just pandering and bull crap. I mean, and it does not, it does not, um, it does not survive scrutiny by anybody who knows anything about economics. I mean, like literally like you go, you go that if you know anything about economics, you know that it is factually false. I mean, like that you, the math does not lie about certain things. There's, if you have the right data, math is going to be correct every single time. And when you say something, well, math doesn't work, then you go, well, no, math doesn't work. Sorry. You get, what are you going to, you know, what are you going to believe? What I tell you or what you saw with your own eyes? Come on, man. You know? <laughs> Don't you trust me? But, um, okay, so 
Fractional reserve banking. Now that's interesting. This is a way by which banks create money. And it would be neat if we had something we could it would be neat if we had little monopoly monies. I'll have to do this sometime. <laughs> we will do a fractional reserve like little thing so I can kind of show you how it works and we can have like a little car, a little toy car and a little toy house and some monopoly money and we and I can show you kind of how it works yeah. and how it actually creates new money. Because here's how it works. Every bank has to have a reserve amount. That's, that's a percentage of your deposits that they have to hold on to. They can't lend it out. So let's say a good reserve amount that's easy to wrap your head around is 10%. That means if I put $100 into the bank, they have to keep 10 of it. They have to keep 10 of it as a reserve and not lend that out, okay? So let's say I get my $100, I put it into bank A. So I'm over here, $100 in the bank, right? So how much of that can they lend out? $90. Because that's they got to keep the ten dollars in the in the vault theoretic the theoretical vault that they have. So and that's I'm glad we've established that money is belief, so that we understand that they don't really have all that money. It's all it's 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 in it's in computer files. It's not you know they have to order actual cash, but that has nothing to that really has nothing to do with money. Essentially, it's it's a, it's just a physical manifestation that some of us use but most of us are increasingly not using that either so um, so essentially they can lend out 90 bucks okay so let's say somebody wants to get take out a car loan for a $90 car because we're playing monopoly money levels or whatever so nine the $90 car or maybe this is just a while ago but um, <laughs> I, maybe you Maybe never. I don't think there was ever ninety dollars. Okay. Anyway, someday. But uh, well, this money is big, so we're just yes, using exactly. it to so, not so I can. So I'm going to go. This guy wants a car loan, so I give him a ninety dollar car loan, which he then goes and pays this guy for the car, and now that guy has that ninety bucks in a check form from the bank, right? He goes over to bank B and deposits it, right? How much money do we have now that exists? He just put a $90 deposit. This guy still got his $100 over here. They're just required to hold on to 10% of it. That's still his money. He can still go in there and withdraw it. So the, I think the, 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 the key facet that you might have glossed over a little bit is that you deposited $100 in bank A. They don't take $90 of that and loan it out. They just credit $90 to... Whoever's taking a loan. So $90 oh. is created it's, it's, it's like a, yeah, it's exactly. It's still sitting there. They didn't they, give your $90 to that person. They're allowed to lend $90 against it. Oh my God. You got it. Yes. You got it. You got it. And he's about to get into the exponential problems. Okay. Now here's what's interesting is that. That's a key point though. Yes. Okay, let's assume. This is where we are. We've, the bank had the bank had a hundred dollars. They have to keep ten. They loaned out ninety. You're saying they still have that hundred and they create an extra ninety. Correct. The bank's liquidated. Okay, yes. we just did a bankruptcy. How much money does the bank have, and how much do its creditors get? It doesn't have a hundred ninety. It has a hundred and it has a debt of ninety. Yeah. It, it it never ends up to more than a hundred. And that and right. see and that obligation is considered an asset. Also, no. it's, it's not an asset if they owe it. It's no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying the bank. debt, the debt itself, the right. accounts, the, uh, the accounts receivable is considered an asset. Essentially, it's it's money that you're going to be contract. owed. The so they got 190. Has value. Yes, the loan, the paper, yes. the paper Between has the two value. Between banks, there's now 190 in assets where there was 100. Now was that can continue to bounce. One bank no, no, no. 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 They don't actually the give them the ninety dollars. They the They're allowed to lend out that virtual ninety dollars, essentially. If they were, if they were liquidated at that point, they, they were, the ninety dollars. Well, see, if they're liquidated, then it unra it starts unraveling very right. rapidly right. because it 
it, once you drop below your reserve amount, now this is where we'll get into centralized banking, which is why it doesn't really happen that much because they have a thing called a discount window, and if they go below their reserve amount, they can borrow extra reserves to keep themselves <laughs> at that reserve amount. But you know, it, oh no, it gets very tricky. But wait, wait, wait. So clarifying question, because I'm really done with math and I hate all of this already. But, but just, I mean, it's just stink. Like it's just no, crazy. No, no. It's, so yeah, okay, both banks now have like if they, that's their only client. That's both banks now have $190. No, and one, bank bank. Has $100. Right. and one bank has $100. And one bank has 90. One bank has 90. But total. 190. 190. But it keeps going. And the 90 yeah. was just invented right. by Bank A. Okay. And basically, that $90. And so you're left with $10? That $90. <laughs> I don't understand. Okay, it's our money. Why do they have it? I'll be, I'll be Bank Is this a, stupid okay. for me to be asking? You deposit $100. No. Well, hold on. No. Let, well, let, I, I just want to let, wait, let me try to finish okay. like the okay. whole thing. Because now that <laughs> now that <laughs> bank with the $90, <laughs> the bank, what, one bank has 100 right now, one bank has 90 right now. And we're not done. So now Bank B can now lend out how much? Eighty one dollars. Oh, because the ten percent. Because because they have to keep not they have to keep nine dollars of the money that was created from the other loan check being deposited there. But to make it clear, maybe if you say they can now have permission to create eighty one dollars. Yes, they now have permission. Exactly. They have permission. That's a better way of putting it. It's a form of money creation. Yeah. Yes. It is a form of they, they are they are allowed they are allowed to lend that. against that asset of the asset of that deposit. I e create which allows them to create eighty one dollars to give out. It's kinda like how in physics problem. now yeah. they're thinking that all matter comes from these imbalances in a vacuum, and it's like you know, when they're when they're apart, it becomes stuff, but when they're together, it becomes nothing. <laughs> kind of, it's like it's kind of a weird physics thing, and I don't remember exactly how it works, but it was an interesting thing. But it would be like this: it's like when you pull these things apart, it's stuff, but when you put them together, it collapses into nothing because you're creating a negative and a positive yeah. that equals zero. So you're not actually making something new. You're you're basically creating. The opposite of something and throwing those things out there, and that's essentially what it's, what that's all based on. So Alchemy. now <laughs> the eighty-one dollars is going to go into Bank C, which can then continue to loan to, and it can continue around in a circle. So there's an easy way to calculate this: express the the, the reserve percentage as a fraction. So ten percent is easy, one tenth, right? Flip that around, ten. That is your money multiplier. That hundred dollars will eventually become a thousand dollars under a ten percent reserve amount. <laughs> now, what happens if we're like, okay, we want to we want to tighten up the amount of money that's in circulation? See, this is how they can do indirect control on the amount of money that's going out. Let's say we raise that reserve amount to twenty. Now, how much money does that hundred dollars become? If we raise the reserve amount to twenty percent. So express it as a fraction, right? We want to express. Oh yeah. It's five hundred because what we do. Okay, so twenty percent is one is one fifth. So we're gonna flip that around to five. Five times one hundred. But what if we want to loosen things up a little bit? We want to drop that to five percent. Then it goes to two thousand. Then it goes to two thousand. Yeah. After Bank C and Lens and all the banks. Bank A, a through Z. Yeah. Goes on infinitely, but and I, I want to create money for themselves. I want to stress. The that, no, I want to stress that this is not in and of itself bad, because it is a way. It is a way. Mm, some would disagree. With that. <laughs> like, mm, or I, have I, problems with it. I don't. But, but no, there are problems with it for sure. But it is. It is not. It is not inarguably a bad thing. It is it is a thing that you can say, okay, there's some positive features to it and there's some negative features to it. And now the way that it's been implemented is a different matter. Also, we all we also have to say, okay, well, when you allow them to do certain other things along with that, yeah, yeah. then it gives them crazy amounts of more power than they should have of money. Like the the whole point of the money creation is for it to spread out through that economy because okay, I want a car, right? So now I have a car. Now that guy got some money, and he's going to do that. What it ends up doing is it causes the money to flow through that economy, and it actually increases. Um, it can it can actually increase the wealth of everyone in that economy. But it's affecting the market that 
they want to. It's, it's, it's that amount. Amount. Okay, well, no, no. I, it, the it's not necessarily up. inflationary either. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the inflationary part because it, it, inflation goes up. Essentially, the, the simplest way to put it is inflation goes up when there's more money than stuff. Like when you, when you, if you have a right, the right amount of money for the amount of stuff that's in the world, then there's no inflation. If you have too much money for the amount of stuff that's in the world then the prices will just go up. And so then it will just go whoop because there's only a certain amount of stuff. Now when new stuff, like you know, let's say World of Warcraft is invented and now there's all kinds of new stuff that was just created by that. And new stuff, you know, it doesn't, that wasn't very much in raw materials comparatively. If you think about the amount of wealth that's been generated yeah. from a game that's essentially an idea that keeps a lot of people employed, I'm not saying I like that game or that it's a good thing for you. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> oh, I, I can I can do you a fun one on that. Okay, so. Sorry, uh, losing me. Okay. Thank you for redirect. Okay, so. So essentially, let's say that game created ten million dollars worth of desire for 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 that stuff that they just virtually created in a virtual world. Well, if we have an inflexible money supply and we have only X number of dollars, well, where's that money going to come from? It comes from the deflation of value of, ev of everything or some other things in the economy. That's essentially it. Uh, deflation of value on the floor. Deflation, deflation of value. Essentially, let's say there's only 100 gold bars in the world. We're going to be on the gold standard today. 100 gold bars in the world. And we have 1,000 economic units of stuff in the world, right? Well, let's say we build a thousand more. Well, we still only have a hundred bars of gold to pay for all that 2,000 economic units of stuff. Okay. So now all that stuff's worth about half as much. And it strongly favors the person who didn't spend the money, but who held onto their brick, because now their brick can buy twice as much stuff. What's that? Wouldn't that be the opposite? I'm sure you're right, but it seems like my head just went, no, it'd be worth twice as much if you have twice as much stuff with the same amount of gold? The gold is worth twice as much now. The gold, gotcha. The gold becomes okay. worth twice, the medium of exchange okay. becomes worth twice as much because you're limiting the okay. amount of that, okay. Okay. but there is no limit to the amount of economic activity, especially when you start adding in services in addition to goods. Mm -hmm. You can create an infinite amount of money worth of service services. So the trick, therefore, and this is what the Federal Reserve is supposed to do, and this is what it's what it should be doing, is to keep prices very, very stable for what they call uh, a basket of goods. And it would be basically a financial abstract representation of what Joe and Jane average s spend their money on. You'd, you'd, you'd want to include housing prices in this basket. You'd want to include car prices, health care, food. And the thing is, the government doesn't always include all those things. A lot of times they cut those things out when they're making these things, and they're saying, oh, things are doing this. And then you find out they've left out healthcare costs, for example. And you go, well, if we're only doing, you know, if prices are going up only by this much, but we're not including healthcare prices, are we really doing a true representation? And that's where you get into this whole complex econometrics and people want to put different emphasis on different things. But essentially, I would think it should be it should be something that we could democratically decide upon if we educated ourselves and go, okay, what do we want to be the measures of the average person's do we want to include a T like do we want to include a TV and if so, how much weight do we want to put on that? Do we want to include a computer? Do we want to include a refrigerator? Do we want to include and how much weight do we put on those things? Oh. So, so this is like the standard of living thing. Yes. It's it's how you relate Oh. That's Do I understand correctly that okay. the function of the Federal Reserve is then to expand, expand and shrink the money supply to, to match yes. the total amount of goods and services in yes. existence? Well, here, let me go. I will go to the uh, the whole thing. We'll do the organization after this, but we'll do the, the functions because this this book handles this really well. Too. There's, a, there's another. You might want to announce. Oh. I don't know. I was, I'm having a... 
an outreach <laughs> meeting at three, but it's three, and anybody, I can just, we can push it off a little bit. What time is GA's? Four? Yeah. Four. Okay. Okay, why don't we go do that? We'll go do you that guys now. Do that? Yeah. You're just mesmerized. I'm gonna put this all online too, so. Okay, good. Okay. Oh, you are. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah, I need a reason. First, the Fed supplies the economy with fiduciary currency. Now, are we doing functions of the Fed? These are the functions of the Federal Reserve System. Okay. Everybody knows how they do that, right? You look on your dollar, it does not say United States note, it says Federal Reserve note. So they have been empowered to print currency. And we get into some constitu interesting constitutional arguments given that that's supposed to be Congress's sole power according to Article 1, Section 8. But that could be discussed at length. Sorry, I rambled that on. Article 1, Section 8 gives, gives Congress the power to, to issue money, essentially, and um, allowing a semi-autonomous creation, because um, they're, they're not, when we get into the function, you'll see that they're, you know, they're not a government bureau, they're not federal, and they have, <laughs> the joke is they're not federal and they have no reserve. So, that's the, and, it, and those things are both true, which is funny, they actually, uh, they actually are literally able to create money, like to, to say money exists, and they can say any amount of money exists, and people will generally accept that. It's pretty okay, crazy. so for example, just going back to how we went to Dan Lundgren's office, he had like it, I went on see OpenSecret.org, mm -hmm. and he's supported by like banks and mortgage uh -huh. companies and all this other real estate associations and all this and okay so that makes sense because like technically if you he's not a federal like federal and he doesn't have reserves but he's allowed to create money so of course those are his constituents that you know we're not his constituents <coughs> well you he will, can't make you will also us. see that no we are not we are indeed not the federal reserve constituents actually Okay. Every, everything that happens with that, although it, it gets some sort of approval from Congress, um, they're all like, I mean, they're all bankers being elected by other bankers. I mean, essentially, all of it. Interesting piece of trivia: uh, the Fed of New York, uh, if I recall, that one of the heads of that is John Stewart from Daily Show's brother. Yes, what? it's it's so weird. Uh, yeah, yeah it's weird. it really pooped oh, in no, my Oh no, it's really hole. weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. From the Daily Show's brother is like, I don't know he's if, he's, if he, he's way up there in one of the Fed Bummer. organizations. It's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, it's a sad story. Are you kidding? How much longer? I need to let my dogs go pee. Are you? I don't want to miss a word. Are we gonna take a break or anything? We can take. A, uh, let me just do this this little section, then we can take a break, and I'll I'll do some questions and all the kind of other kinds. Of, okay. So, fiduciary currency. We all understand that. Okay. <laughs> as best as we're going to. <laughs> and then, in, it, now, this is also interesting, is that <laughs> if you read your dollars also, they are the obligation and liability of the Federal Reserve System, not the U.S. government. That's the other weird thing about our money, is that the obligation is, the obligation to back that money is the Federal Reserve, not the government. The government does not actually ba back, we, the government does not actually technically back our currency. So... <gasps> Um. We'll see him in hell. I don't know. <laughs> I know to All right, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can go there. Like, they want okay. to. Know, but. No, no... I plan on another. Okay. The Fed also provides a system for check collection and clearing, and that's done in a very hierarchical. It goes to this. It goes up to these different. Up through these different things that are eventually cleared by the Federal Reserve. So all yeah. all check clearing eventually goes yeah. there. The yes. So, well, here's a good example right here. How a check clears. This person goes, deposits their check, Citibank San Francisco. Citibank of San Francisco deposits right there. Federal Reserve Bank San Francisco. Then that goes to Federal Reserve Bank Chicago, and then First National Bank Chicago. Oh see? my god, you have to scan that and put that online. See, so this is like, do you see how it is? It's like, yeah, this is, be in the video. you see the two different people. It's because this is the bank who's, uh, who's cashing the check. So they're like, okay, we just cashed this check. So it goes over here, 
and then they tell the other Federal Reserve Bank, and then it goes there. And of course, the Federal this Reserve check Bank came from Chicago. That's that's a key point. This check yeah, is written by the check by is written by the person who goes to First National Bank oh, in sorry. Chicago. This is the person cashing the check. Oh, this is the person eye. whose check is being cashed. But do you see how the relationship works? There's the there's a total Federal Reserve middleman in all check transactions. So San As Francisco fun- gets plus two hundred. Chicago gets minus two hundred. Yes. So they're essentially intimately aware of, of the very smallest of financial transactions that occur through the check cashing system. They know, and with computers now, it's back then they knew, but it's kind of academic. Now you can actually create statistical models based on this stuff and figure out things that we, the regular folks, have no ability to figure out. That because, and, and the ability to know what's going to happen, essentially. You can yeah. predict things. No. Which is why uh, we're having this endemic problem with these these quick tr- transactions going on. Like seventy five percent of all equity trades are now these flash these flash like microsecond transactions. Now it's it, it, it's because they call it picking up dimes from in front of steamrollers. They know when where things are going. Essentially, it's this, it's this flash trading where they're where they're doing this trade of paper. In a microsecond before things shift from other things that they know are going to happen are happening, and essentially yeah. it's not investing; it's no. it's, it's just it's, algorithms. It's, it's, <laughs> it, what's algorithms? You're taking yeah. advantage yeah. of loopholes in the system. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're basically rigging money for yourself. Yeah. It's like stealing half pennies off paychecks. Very similar to that kind of. It, well, morally, anyway, I, mechanically it's not, but uh, but morally it's <laughs> essentially the same. What, what you're doing is, you're, yep. I can't. What's the word? Can we? Can we? It'll you be want? Online. It'll be online. Uh, no, I can't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. The federal, the Fed holds depository. Oh. oh yeah. Let's pause. Okay. We can pause. Can we pause? Let's pause and take okay. a quick, we'll quick potty right break. Back. Okay. I swear. Don't this, say a this word. Gets really while I'm <laughs> like I said, this is like a whole like. Over, this is over a week's worth of class. Do it. Just the part I'm getting to now, not the part I already went through. The part I already went through, you already had to know. Before you got to so we got our coffee stirred. That looks great. To consume. That's a tool. I like it. We got hands too. Don't forget, we got the speculators or gamblers. Aluminum commodities. Which is that one depot where you're actually holding the physical aluminum, which are these big giant piles of crap, basically all the scrap and everything else. Uh, you only have to release a certain amount of weight per day or whatever when it's being requested. When people are saying, I want to cash in my, my commodities receipts and I want my actual aluminum because I'm about to make some soda cans. So what they've essentially done is they've created this gigantic mega super depot that has like... And I, I'll have to look to confirm the percentage of the world's aluminum, but it's significant. It's in the double digits, the amount of aluminum that they have in here. And what they're doing is they're taking advantage of that rule, and they're only letting a certain amount out, so it's creating this artificial shortage of, of actual physical aluminum. There's not a shortage of aluminum. There's a shortage of physical aluminum available to be used. And so they're artificially creating profit, and they're Scarcity. holding it. Not only do they hold it, they get paid to store it because that's part of the commodities rules. The depots get paid rent on storing it. So not only that, they're ripping off the people who are storing their stuff there because because they can't get their stuff out at, at the rate that they would like. So it's, it's really pretty horrible. It's, it's taking advantage of obvious loopholes in the rules. Like that was not... We said that you know because it's because it can be too cost intensive to remove all that aluminum really really fast and then pull it all back in and then throw it all back out. It's like to allow the storage people a little bit of like okay, we can plan. We're gonna do this many tons of aluminum per day, so we know we're gonna be shifting this. We're gonna be shifting this, and so they've taken advantage by going okay. Well, we're gonna create a city sized big bucket of aluminum and only let you guys have this little pebble out <laughs> each day they while we store it. With diamonds, right? Oh yeah. Well, the De Beers family essentially yeah. the only reason why diamonds have any value whatsoever because really diamonds aren't worth crap now because they can be totally art you can make artificial diamonds that are so close to perfect that it it doesn't matter and they do them for industrial use all the time. But essentially the slave labor diamond 
people like the De Beers family, they want to keep that value artificially yeah, high, so they hold all the bottle. diamonds. Somewhere in there. And it's interesting because I don't know. If, I don't know. Are diamonds commoditized? I am not sure if there's a diamonds commodity because I don't recall there being one. Hmm. Because if it, you know what, because if there was a diamonds commodity, you know there isn't one because there are varying qualities. Because if there is, there was one, somebody would just start making diamonds because it would be way cheaper and it would drive the price of all diamonds way down. So they don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> problem. <laughs> okay. Number three, we've already gone over two. I'm just going to re- reorient us here. Okay. The Fed supplies the economy with fidu- fiduciary currency. It provides a system for check collection and clearing. So you know they're, they're, their fingers are on all that. Number three, it holds the depository institution's reserves. So those local Fed, those 12 Feds, they hold that little 10%. That 10% doesn't stay at that bank. That 10% goes to Papa. Papa gets to hold on to that. Mm. Huh. So, huh. And, and then Grandpapa is the actual Federal Reserve. So I don't know. <laughs> it's mostly all guys. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it really. It, That's white true guys too. too bit. Yeah, but mostly who's all. Pop, who's popping most, that? Who's popping that? Uh, would be the twelve Federal Reserve, kind of like the uh, okay. okay. branches. Oh, like, like the, 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 di- the district banks. Well, here's. I I want to get into the structure, but this is a map of like all Same the different crew, districts of the Federal Reserve. Same mob. Yeah. New York gets their own notice. <laughs> and they're the ones that get to vote. Well, I mean, look, time. California is way more economically powerful than New York, and look at like what we're all lumped in. Yeah. So. Okay. So interesting. But and Texas and Maine, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> no, 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 Texas and uh, Texas and part of. Now I don't know oh, what this funny easy. business is about. We're like this little section of, oh, yeah, yeah, like where their their state is split in half, and there's another state split in half there. I don't know anything about like Pennsylvania's got like a third of it shaved off on one side. There's good. There's probably some sort of shenanigans related you know. <laughs> related explanation for that. I would I would have no, you know you, Kentucky and and Tennessee are cut in half. Shenanigans. Oh, and Alabama's kind of yeah. It's like all of them are all kind of. How come remi- California looks so like nice and oriented. Well, it's because it's like all these states oh, are all one. Oh, the entire oh, West Coast oh. is just like. Boop, that's well, you got to remember this. That's when this was first fine. formed, it was 1913. So, oh, like, we didn't have the kind of economic clout we have now. That's way more powerful than uh, back then. This might be a good argument for Occupy. Well, uh, anyway, go ahead. Everything's a good argument. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that was back in the day. That was like Louisiana. The Fed acts as the government's fiscal agent. The Federal Reserve is essentially the banker of the government. It's the government, the federal government's bank. Um, so what is a fiscal agent, Sean? I mean, that may be obvious. So essentially, the U.S. Treasury has a checking account with the Federal Reserve, where all the government <laughs> money is. That's what that yes. Wow. They have a, well, they they have a checking account essentially with the Federal Reserve. Like basically that. That's where they put all the tax money gets deposited in it, and then all the money they spend comes out of it. Now, Sean, is it not only just the government's bank, but is it also the big banks' banks too? Like, is it well, like yeah. the big banks well, like J.P. Morgan, Bank of America? Like, well, no, the, all, 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 big all actual banks, all, yeah. all actual banks are under its right. control. As you see, they uh-huh. hold all their reserves. Right. They also, okay, <laughs> they also supervise depository institutions. So okay. they're allowed to make rules, not Congress. They are sure. allowed to make rules that cannot be essentially subverted by Congress about things like that. They, uh, well, is that in violation of the Constitution? What's that? Is that, is that in violation of the Constitution? Mm, no. Okay. Then I would argue. Yeah. Well, no, the money masters on well, YouTube. Well, you are... N- money different masters. things that, that they do are, are, are arguably the constitutional. <laughs> supervising, supervising depository institutions no, isn't necessarily... Being, because you, Congress could really give it, can give the EPA the power <laughs> to supervise... Environmental Except issues. Except that it's not a federal agency, yeah. but there's no rule that says it has to be. I mean, there's no words there's say federal agency them, though, in the. To do that in the Constitution. Um, to commission a private bank and have it take on. You okay? Well, no. To commission a private bank, there's. Then you get into a doctrine of implied power. See, this is where we can get into some really technical legal arguments that have been made, because. As you also notice, almost all the legislation dealing with things like this, like banks, is very vague and difficult to 
grasp a hold of and even understand in, in some cases. Um, I mean, a perfect example of something that's a, that, that's a, that's a bank-serving piece of paper is your mortgage agreements. If you read those and take into account, I mean, I'm a signing, I, I used to be a signing agent. I've, I've presided over like 2,000 mortgage signings. You have personally? Yes. Huh. I have a law degree, and I've seen every form of good and bad loan known to man. I've seen people with impeccable like 800 credit get just, just, I mean, for lack of a better word, just financially raped by a mortgage company. I mean, like, where they're paying like 20 20 grand on the front end for a loan and and they don't realize that the banks get paid 20 20 the lenders get paid 20 on the back end too because they're giving them a worse deal than what par mortgages and dirty you know wait, wait repeat that yeah I'm really in the, i didn't hear business I, was, I, I, I was saying i i saw one i saw one where they were getting where they were do they were charging three points on the front end and they were making three points on the back end. The way you get points, which is a percentage points, are if I make three points on the back end, that's because I could give you a six percent loan and instead I'm giving you like, you know, an eleven percent loan or whatever. I mean it's small smaller percentages than that. The worse loan I give you, the more points I get towards money for me. And the more percentage points of your entire mortgage value. So you're being financially motivated to screw the person you're Oh, absolutely. Wait, wait. Okay. So, okay, in real life situation, like last week, it, the rates were at 4.25. Yes. That's par. Okay. Par. The, if par rate is 4.25, we're talking about par rate. Okay. Now, par rate, is, if par rate's 4.25, maybe I can pay two points, like 2%. To get it for like 3.25, and maybe that's worth it for me. Maybe I'd rather pay that money up front and have a really, really low the the the, the, the person who's the borrower for the okay, mortgage. Thank you. But or I could or and and the thing is, I mean, in my experience, a mortgage broker should get paid about two points. That's that's what's considered to be reasonable, at least in my experience. If you're if you're trying to get more than two points, then you're really gouging. And okay. if you're and if you're if you're taking less than two points, and a lot of them will take one point, then you're then you're being pretty pretty reasonable, okay. generally speaking. Yeah. We can let you go on. But yeah, I, this is I'll, fascinating. I'll though. Twenty minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, supervised depository institutions. Now that is along with the FDIC, which is a government federal deposit insurance corporation, the uh, Office of Thrift Supervision in the Treasury Department, and the National Credit Union Administration. So there's, and there's various other agencies that we're attempting to, you know, the, the, the consumer protection uh, agency that Cordray just got uh, recess appointed to. Okay. Fed acts as the lender of last resort. And this is where we get into the, the stuff that people are very, that, that people are not nearly as upset as they should be about. Um, they, they stand ready to assist temporarily any, I love even in this book, it paints it very rosy. It, ready to assist temporarily any part of the banking system that is in trouble. In this sense, it acts as lender of last resort to depository institutions that it has decided should not be allowed to fail. Oh, and it gets okay, to decide. It, it has, it has decided when they failed. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> now, but but hold on now. Now, in their supervision, they can actually take over a bank that's not performing. They can say you are. You are in breach of fiduciary duty. You're not doing a good job. You're screwing things up. We are going to take your bank over, and they can do that. Remember, they hold all the reserves for all the bank. Like that, banks exist because the Federal Reserve System allows them to exist. They're the ones who are allowing them to exist. So they have to basically do what the Fed tells them to do. It's pretty. It's. Um, the FDIC or the OTS or the well, no, the, the, no, the, 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 indivi no, the individual fed, the individual twelve Federal Reserve banks can directly take them over. Can take over a bank. Yes, wow. can, can basically say that we we are going to decide how this thing is going to be run. 
So there's a lot I mean, it, of books. It's not like they take over ownership. It's, it is almost like a bank being nationalized by a government, though. It's very yeah, similar. It's like, okay, we are now making the decisions, not your investors, not your board of directors. The we are now going to make the decisions for that. What's that? I mean, if a bank fails, the FDIC takes over the actual assets. It will decide. Well, see, now that's if a bank fails. Them. This is not. Yeah. This is this is saying, okay, you're screwing up. We're taking. We're going to take over your bank, and it doesn't have to fail for them to do that. They can decide it's being mismanaged or recklessly managed, and they can do that. We don't like your face. Basically. We don't like. They can't. But it's still well, and then of course there's you know, the, okay, they also regulate the money supply. Now this is interesting. What are we doing now? What's this? This is what the Fed does. What it what it does. Um, so they regulate the money supply, and, and the way they do that, I will get into it in just a second. And it's interesting because it's not intuitive. Essentially, it's by buying and selling treasuries. So let's say they buy a bunch of treasuries. What what does that what does that do when they when they buy treasuries? It, it creates more money in the money. It creates supply. more money. Yeah. Because they create money out of thin air. Yeah. They buy treasuries. They're Gov treasury Gov bonds. Treasury government bonds. treasury bonds. From the treasury. Uh, well, they're not from the treasury. They're buying them, I think, from Goldman Sachs right now. <laughs> um, no, they, no the, and, and all these big financial institutions, all are making intermediary money on all these exchanges that occur. When the when the deposits go in, when they come back out, the federal government's being charged for that. How does the treasury bond go into that? Me? Isn't it true that, that all It's money just create the, the they're just created by the government. Okay. They're a piece Later of paper on, that the go now the, now the government will back treasuries. That's the thing. And that's the weird relationship. These guys can create money for free and what they do is they, they buy treasuries when they want it. And you think you're thinking they're they're taking something, but no, that's how they release money into circulation. But who but see, who are they giving the money see it, it's it's not necessarily the only way to get money into circulation, if you think about it, but it, it's a way to centrally get money into circulation through specifically controlled avenues controlled by them. Okay. Essentially, they, they right. put right. all money that goes into or out of the economy flows through this filter, and they skim at every level of that filter, and that's another issue. <laughs> and, and, if, and if all they were doing was skimming to maintain the system... And to be able to keep volatility out, like for for example, to make sure that money is sound and that and that it's backed and that and that we we have the right amount of money, so the, the prices are not going to start going up. If it was doing that, doing that transparently, it's something that could be done. But right now, it's done. They don't. I mean, if you saw Ben Bernanke in front of Congress, he said, "No, I'm. You know, you, you should have told us who we gave this money to. No, because it would have it would have discouraged the banks from coming again for emergency lending." And, and at that point, I mean, my opinion of that is that, well, okay, too bad. But if you can't, if you can't handle your business without emergency lending, then your stockholders and your customers deserve to know that that you're yeah. you're so poorly mismanaged that you have that you're having to borrow like half a trillion or a quarter of a trillion dollars just to remain solvent. I don't want I don't want to be involved in an institution that that that's, uh, that needs that kind of huge amount of capital inflow just to be able to function. You said that, that the Fed buys treasury bonds yes. and to, well, and to, sells. to inject money into the system, to, the, to grow the supply of money on hand. Yes. Well, Essentially, they do, they do that initially. They buy those treasury bonds from the government. Now, those are all government-issued yes. bonds. Those are government-issued bonds. So the initial transaction where, it, where money is initially created is the Fed prints it and the... And yes. the Federal Prince government bonds, gives right? bonds, so it's an exchange. They, yes, they're, they're buying bonds. It, it they're is, it is once again the, the it is once again the creation of taking a taking right. zero and making a negative thing an obligation and making a positive thing money that if put together collapses into nothing. Mind you, they're not paying <clears> the face value. Oh, no, I love this guy. Well, when we start getting into bond discounting, I don't want to get in, like, that's that's another, like, getting into bond discounting so, is going to get too technical for what we're trying to do today, at least. So the Treasury yeah, Department, I'm going to ask you, is it going to create a piece of paper that says, this is a Treasury bond. Yes, government creates a Treasury okay. bond. It says, this is a Treasury bond. The government will pay you X at the maturity of this Treasury bond. I'm the Treasury Department. I'm going to sell it to you now, and you are going to take... 
I, then you're gonna give me money. Then I'm gonna print my own pieces of paper, yeah. call them Federal Reserve notes, and give them back bills. to you. And then what am I gonna do with it as the Treasury Department? Well, how so you're gonna spend it, spend it uh, however Congress decided theoretically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does, okay. Does this support <laughs> with the right that then all you. money yep. is created <laughs> out of debt? <laughs> right. Well, that right. All money Isn't that kind of how it's been working? It's created out of debt. I mean, I don't. The want way, to that, way that we, <coughs> the way that we create it, yes. Yeah. I think well, that's worth saying. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. You that all that all money is created. Out, she was just want, wanted to mention that 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 essentially means that all money put into circulation is created out of debt. Right. Yes. Right. So. That's a big cleaning zeitgeist. If you paid off all the government debt, there that. would be no money in circulation. It would be. It would. It would yeah. yeah it's. Long. It's like. It's like a particle and an antiparticle, and they, boom, gone. Nothing. You and might. There. There are two. There are two things. Know this? What's that? Do all economists? Everybody's got a degree in economy. Oh, absolutely. So there's a lot of people walking around know this. Oh, well, I don't feel that they have any alert Yeah, but they'd rather, well, they'd rather see, push Freakonomics on but, us. But, okay, now, now let me get the last... Okay, this okay. is the last thing sorry, the Fed sorry, does. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the last thing the Fed okay. does is intervene in foreign currency markets. Guess what? <laughs> intervene in foreign currency. Foreign currency markets. And this is a complicated... Because su- the way this works is complicated also. But ba- essentially what they do is they buy and sell U.S. dollars on... There's a foreign currency exchange market. And interestingly enough, one of the ways that China is keeping their currency so low in relation to ours is that they are buying, they're basically converting to dollars and they're buying a bunch of treasuries themselves. Their government is creating debt, like huge deficit spending in China, to buy tons of dollars worth of treasuries and hold them, which makes their their currency plummet. Because they're inflating their money supply. So in relation to the dollar, the, uh, yuan, I believe, it, 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 it loses value. But that And that also pumps our value up. So what it does is it creates a trade imbalance where you're going to see a lot more goods flowing in for cheaper. Now, at a, at a future time, I want to get into why... That's not necessarily a bad thing for us in the long run because we're getting all their stuff. The actual stuff we're getting. And this debt exchange, eventually, that scheme cannot last forever. They cannot continue to just deflate, deflate, deflate their currency. But once the the stuff is no longer usable, then we can't even sustain our own society because we've we've had grown a dependency on China. Well, no, see, no. see, see now, I don't we know. have a certain. Well, see now, the, the problem is not necessarily even that because China can't. China, I mean, none of us exist in a vacuum, and it's not like China isn't really just a big monolithic entity as much as people seem to think. There's a lot of different entrepreneurs there. They have businesses in there, and. You know the way this thing works is it does eventually break down. People want to be capitalist when you when there's money to be made, <laughs> and you know you'll you see uh, when Russia became capitalist that instead of what we normally do is we we sell all their natural resources to to we, we force them to give their natural resources to our companies. Instead, the Russians were all screw you, and they made their own companies and gave right. and they they created banks, created debt, lent money to all these guys who were in their. Their clubs, who are now, they now call them the oligarchs because they're oligarchs now. They basically let them borrow all this money, and they bought all they bought these things at ten cents on the dollar sometimes, but forty cents on the dollar for most of them. Things like the oil that was a national oil company, things like all the mines. There's a lot of mines in Russia, and these guys made billions and billions of dollars, and then they screwed everybody on the loans and like. That's hanging around all the Russian people's necks. That's one of the reasons why they're occupying so hard out there. Because the oligarchs basically robbed the whole country. And they and they not only did that, they also exported all that wealth. Which is one of the things that's happening here. Is all these guys are exporting this wealth. They're, they're trying to take it out of country. Which is why you see this thing where we're doing this uh, tax haven thing. You, you've heard about this. They're making all this money overseas. And you hear this thing where, oh, well we need to have... We need to have a repatriation tax holiday. What? what? No. Yeah. Yeah. We, what do you mean we need a re? Because it'll encourage all the money to come back. But so, but you're still encouraging them to invest overseas. So they're going to come back. They're going to screw around with it here, and they're going to take the money back out again, and they're going to wait for the next holiday to bring it back. Because you're going to encourage that behavior if you do that. Now, before you go on, the intervene in the foreign currency, the China 
and uh, lowering the why would they lower the value of their own money? Could you go to back? increase exports because yeah. they're because they are not a consumption. Seventy percent of our economy is based on consumption. We are a hugely consumptive. Their mm. their theirs is way more. Their GDP is exports. I mean, like they consume very little individually. They. They survive on a pittance. Most people in China survive on a pittance. You know, this is a place. This is a place where um, industries go to shed jobs, and what's which we can get into at some other time. One thing I want to get into is that we're going to de- have some systemic, permanent, huge, and increasing unemployment. It's going to be our natural rate of unemployment where everything reaches equilibrium eventually that is going to rise and it's going to continue to rise worldwide due to advances in automation and robotics uh, but i still don't see why china would lower the value of their own right. so that they can sell more stuff to us How, why does that make it so they can sell more stuff because now we're in because debt now a dollar can right? buy like instead of a dollar buying five dollars worth of chinese stuff it could buy ten dollars worth of chinese stuff yeah, we're like we want more chinese anything. stuff this is so cheap and so we're buying it Oh, because of the value. I, I don't. Because they've devalued their currency on purpose. It's like when they. Like they did. It's like what? Microeconomics? <laughs> well, that's a different type of competition. Now. Well, see, see, with this, this is the intent to. This is the intent to completely devalue their own currency and. Slightly overvalue ours. Now, you all. How is that devaluing happen? Is there a board of people that sit and say, well, let's. It's because the way that that an increase in money supply works in any economy is that it's weird. It is almost like uh, Adam Adam Smith referred to the invisible hand of the market. It is weird the way these things work, but they do work this way. If you start adding more money, once that money starts circling around, there's, there's more money than stuff. Well, then. The value of your money goes down. Supply and demand applies to money. And when you're dealing with currency versus currency, it's very easy to do that just directly from one government to another. They borrow, let's say they borrow a hundred billion dollars, and they just go buy a hundred billion dollars in treasuries. Well, now, now they just went and took all those treasuries, and now they have this huge amount of debt. They have too much money in circulation, so their value, value of their currency goes down. Our value. And, and so our value relative to theirs goes up. Wait a minute, no. So if they bought so, our treasuries, then more money is circulating in our economy, so our, so our goods would be inflated, go, right? No? It, no, it, it has to do with the it, it, do, it does. Um, theirs, be there's, theirs becomes relatively cheaper. So it also. Well, we took on more debt when they bought our treasuries, right? Oh, I wish I had it. No, see, now, they, now, now here's the thing about China and treasury bonds. It, they are manipulating our currency, and they're they're really manipulating their own more than they're manipulating ours. Like they they are they have a small effect on our currency, but they're having a huge effect on theirs. So it doesn't matter because boop, boop, bump this one up, bump this one down. Their their object is increase the gap. So no matter how they do it, if they increase that gap, it's good for them. Um, but why? But in the long in the long but in the long run, see, and this is this is why. I, this is why I wish I, I want to get Chris down here to talk about this because he really is eloquent about this. You're eloquent. Yeah, thank just, you. you in the in the long run, what happens is we're getting all their stuff. We're we're extracting all their natural resources. Like stuff is what matters. I mean, money is money is largely fictional, and yeah, there's all these obligations, but. The other thing is money gets because we do have inflation. And there's reasons why that's not necessarily a bad thing too, um, because in f- who does inflation hurt? Lenders. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't hurt people. It doesn't hurt consumers. It holds anybody who has money. Anybody who's holding money is hurt by inflation, because what happens is when inflation goes up, wages will rise. All these things will rise. There's there's something called price stickiness, which is like okay, the price went up by like three percent. Inflation, but but it costs a lot of money. No, what you're saying about the cost of living earlier is the government can say okay, cost of living is is your 
groceries and your shelter, uh-huh. but that doesn't include things like health care and other things well, that... Well, sometimes it doesn't. What I'm saying is there's different measures of it, and you got to be... When you're looking at somebody reporting on things like that, you need to look and see which measure they're using. Just like with unemployment. No, there's unemployed, no. and that means you're actively looking for, for employment, and then there's like long-term jobless that have stopped looking... But they would take a job if, if they saw that they were available. Right. There's a bunch of different categories of that, and you have to watch out which ones of those you're looking at. And then there's people who are not working, and that could include retired people who don't want to work. So then you go, it might look like a big number, but then you're like, well, there's a lot of retired people in this community. Oh, well, the retirees might be skewing. So you have to look at each one of those numbers and see how they relate. So going back to how, so that negatively affects the lenders, you said, yes? Inflation well, it negatively, no, Inflation negatively affects all holders of currency. Anybody who has okay. money. Okay. Anybody who's holding to, money. To save it, and then it's like becoming worthless in two years, then, then you're hurt. You're, you're screwed. But see, and that also means if you have a, if you have if you have long term savings, it does screw you. If you have if, if you have money, then it screws you. But it screws the one percent more than it screws us. So that I mean, that, it is something to be considered. But they, that inflation they made does this. Screw. They, but going back to what we talked about in the very beginning of That's the basic why, definitions, they made money out of nothing, out of thin air. Yeah. So the, by the fact that they're screwing themselves, so to speak. Who cares? How they live while they, they, they were they were the one they wanted to have this money put into circulation, so they created it. Yes. So when it's but going see now back now there now there's now we can get into uh-huh. we could also get into at a later time the different types of monetary systems that are possible or we can get into the different ones that have been tried and we can get into different ones that are possible because possible is different because we can get into like resource based economy stuff we can get into. Yeah, yeah. We get into interesting things like there, I've seen suggestions that the government issue money, and the way that they, what they do is they create money anytime the government needs to fulfill a function. Cops will kill you. They will. They will. They will break um, their arms and they will kill you. Can we make this like a bi-weekly or weekly sure. teaching? Because yeah. economics. Yeah, let's uh, do that. I, I, since I, since I am like going back and probably going to graduate school for it, I, I should oh. talk about it a lot because I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do some and teaching. You're gonna come next week. week on your test. Yeah. Sure, I, I can do that so next week. What time is that? Three o'clock. This is great. Um, two we can do it anytime people want. Two, two is when we did it. Two is when we did it today. I'm fine with either.